A new day dawns over New Zealand's Southern Alps, backdrop to the Southern Lakes. Below lies the township of Wanaka. All is quiet, calm, even serene, but not for long. It's the warbirds over Wanaka weekend. Once every two years, when the skies above Wanaka play host to aircraft that once flew over the battlefields of Europe, Asia and the Pacific. 20, 50, even 100 years later, they're in the air again, assembled together for what's been called one of the greatest warbird shows in the world. Easter 2000 and all roads lead to Wanaka. The normal population of three and a half thousand swells to over a hundred thousand as warbird enthusiasts from all over the world flock to this premier living museum of aviation history. For many, it's a once in a lifetime chance to get close to the planes, to talk to the people who fly them, and of course, to see them in action. First up, the A4 Skyhawks from 75 Squadron of the Royal New Zealand Air Force. The first two Skyhawks arrived at the Royal New Zealand Air Force in 1970. 30 years and several complete major upgrades later, Skyhawks are still New Zealand's frontline combat aircraft. Air-to-air -air refuelling is common enough in the world's air forces, but it took the RNZAF to turn it into an aerobatic manoeuvre. From a modern warbird to one of the very first, the Blériot 11. Structurally the same as the one flown by Louis Blériot across the English Channel in 1909, but with a more powerful rotary engine, the Blériot saw active service in the First World War. It's owned and flown by Michael Carlson from Sweden and brought into New Zealand especially for warbirds over Wanaka. This is the first aircraft used in aerial war because of warfare. It was used in 1914, 1913, while the French army used it. Also, most of the countries in the world, this was the first aircraft that flew in the, in the country.
this particular one, this is a Blario 11 of the 1910 model. The 1909 model that crossed the channel the first time had another engine, 25 horsepower, Ansani engine. But this is the 1910 model, and uh, then they re equipped it with the Gnome Omega, the 50 horsepower rotary engine. Most of the Blerios were not built in France, they were built in different countries. They built a lot in England, in America, Germany, and Sweden. So this one is built under license in Sweden. But it was built very late. It was used in the flying school in Sweden. So they, well, they crashed a lot, so they built a lot. And uh, this was built 1918. That's very late for this type of aircraft. But it's still 1910 model. They didn't change it at all. Well, I tried to fly low because I found out early in the testing that if the engine stops or quits, you can't glide it. Not the chance. Too much drag, and the CG is 51% of the wing cord. That means if you don't have a slipstream from the engine, you can't keep the tail up. You can't really get the nose down and get the speed up. So the aircraft just stops and falls down like a parachute. So it's better to stay low just for the safety of it. Blario come up with this solution. This is Blario 11, so it was 10 before this one, with a different way to try to control the aircraft. But on the 11th, they use this system, and this is a conventional system, except that you don't have ailerons. You warp the wing, twist the wing. But, well, it don't really work well. It's, uh, it has its limitations, yes. It's, it, but it's a conventional system and it works like in the modern airplane. You roll it, pitch and rudder. So in that way it's, it's, uh, it's easy to fly in calm weather. But the wing, wing warping is not efficient at all if in gusty weather. That's why it's dangerous to fly if it's too gusty. So you really you fly it with the rudder and try to balance it with the wing warping. And in, in the gusty weather it's more like the stick, it's more like a moral support to hold on to. Here's a landing, and watch these big wheels as he lands. There's loads of bungee up at the front. It's quite a advanced for it to take. This is the famous Gnome Omega engine. It's a French design from 1908. And this is the engine that started the rotary revolution when started building rotary engines. They found out that uh, it's a very, it's a good engine. It's a lot of power, a lot of torque because the whole engine is a flywheel. So it's, it's a light engine compared to the horsepower. And also they are very simple. So they're very s seldom you have failures. This aircraft, yeah, we know the full story of it. It was built late in Sweden at the Tulin company. They went into Tulin flying school. 
we, we're not sure if they used it at the flying school. Very, it came very late there and the school closed down and the aircraft was sold at an auction. I went to a private guy up north in Sweden. He assembled it. They say he flew it once, then the pol police stopped him flying because he had no license. He took it completely apart. I say completely, even not a bolt went out of it. One tin can with bolts, one with nuts, one with steel brackets. And he placed it in a boathouse. And there it remained until 1965. Another guy f bought it, moved it to a barn. And that's where I found it, 1986. It's easy to pull apart, yeah? It takes roughly one hour to do it. It's a very simple aircraft due to it's a monoplane. The biplanes they built in those days, it can take a couple of days to re-rig them and disassemble them. But this aircraft, if you're two people that used it, you can pull it apart in 30 minutes. But the cleaning takes three hours. <laughs> To craft of more complicated design now, a mass display by turbine-powered helicopters from all over New Zealand. As they go through their paces, demonstrating the extreme agility of the helicopter and the beauty and grace, it's worth noting these are all working machines in the fields of transport, agriculture, military and search and rescue. Back to fixed wing now with the procession led by one of the world's most famous biplanes, the de Havilland Tiger Moth. The single wing Cessna Bird Dock, used by the US Army as an observer aircraft in Vietnam. The graceful beach stagger wing, named not surprisingly for the backward stagger of its wings. And the de Havilland Fox Moth. This particular aircraft was built in 1932 to become part of the Royal Flight. The skies take on a reddish tinge as the Chinese Nanchang CJ-6 and the Russian Yakovlev Yak-52 take to the air. Both are based on the Yakovlev Yak-18 design, the Nanchang dating from the 50s, while the Yak-52 saw later production. This is the Yak with the rounded tail and exposed landing gear. 
its wings are shorter, and at 360 horsepower, its engine is more powerful than the 285 horsepower of the Nanchang. The Nanchang was primarily a trainer. The Yak was purpose-built for aerobatic competition. is a tail slice backwards and then a ding dong. Now, I don't know what a ding dong actually is, and I hate to describe it, but there it was. And watch to the left. YAX is flown here by Viktor Ostapenko, test pilot and aerobatics instructor from Russia. Ostapenko is performing an individual routine, but synchronized with three other yaks, led by Sir Kenneth Hare in the blue YAQ. Viktor Ostapenko was born with a high proportion of aviation fuel in his veins. His father was also a test pilot and aerial acrobat. A common sight in the Pacific during World War II the consolidated PBY Catalina leads the big warbirds out onto the tarmac, captained by Dee Wakelin, probably the only woman pilot rated on Catalinas. is joined by probably the world's most famous workhorse, the Douglas C-47. 
followed by another pre-war transport that came into its own during World War II, the Beach C-45 Expediter, flown over from Australia for the air show. And completing the lineup, the de Havilland Devon. The Catalina's stabilizing floats are retractable. Once in the air, they become streamlined wingtips. After the war, the C-47 went on to become the world's most common and reliable airliners, as the DC-3. This particular aircraft was built in 1943 and flew with the Royal Air Force. The PBY Catalina served with the Canadian Air Force. It was bought by the Catalina Group and flown to New Zealand in 1994. The Devon saw many years of service in New Zealand. And this particular C-45 flew several missions for the CIA and has the bullet holes to prove it. Major players in the war against weeds, the turbine-powered Cresco top dressers from New Zealand's Whanganui Aero Work. The company pioneered aerial top dressing in New Zealand. Its display team are now in great demand at air shows everywhere. Not many aircraft can produce such a smokescreen. Even fewer can go in reverse. Pilots, Richmond Harding, known as Ditch, who's managing director of Wanganui Aero Work, his son John and brother Bruce. The star of the 1998 Warbirds over Wanaka and a crowd pleaser again the amazing Polycarpovs. Chaika and the I-16 monoplane called the Ishak.
gloves left in the world. With eight all flying here together, the world's first since 1945. Even more impressive, considering six years ago, they were wrecks lying in the Russian tundra. It's a tribute to Sir Tim Wallace and his Russian adventures. The Chaika is the fastest biplane fighter ever produced, with a wartime top speed of 279 miles an hour. They fought in Russia, Finland, and against the Japanese in China. These three were restored in Russia before being shipped to Wanaka for their world debut at Warbirds over Wanaka 2000. I absolutely love flying the, the Chaika, it's a, it's a very uh, exciting fighter to, to fly, it is a fighter aircraft, it flies and feels like a fighter in the air and handles like a fighter, it's extremely uh, manoeuvrable, uh, very fast uh, and um, probably has claims to being the best biplane fighter ever produced. fighter to fly. Um, as a fighter pilot, of course, I was particularly interested to feel the handling of the aircraft and to experience how manoeuvrable it was. And I, I find that it's a, a very heavy aircraft to uh, throw around the sky during formation aerobatic practice and tail chase practice for the air show and a little bit of simulated air combat manoeuvring uh, with Tom Middleton and the other Chaika. Uh, the aircraft is extremely heavy uh, on the controls. It has no trims and so you can't take the load off in normal flight or, or in uh, aerobatic flight. So you've just got to uh, uh, use two hands sometimes and, uh, and pole the aeroplane around the sky. But for all that, uh, a very effective uh, fighter, quite well armed, and there was no doubt that although it was outclassed by the Messerschmitt 109, when the Germans attacked Russia, it gave a very good account of itself, and a Chaika well handled against the Messerschmitt would certainly have kept the, uh, the Messerschmitt pilot uh, very much uh, on his toes, and uh, nothing was given until the, the end result. interesting to, to fly in terms of uh, the pure flying because of the characteristics, the tailwheel uh, characteristic um, and the fact that so much of the aeroplane is in front of the pilot. If you look at the aircraft side on you can see that almost two thirds of the aircraft is in front of the pilot. Big wings, big engine. Russia. 
Although outclassed by the later German fighters, they nevertheless played a vital role. And these five survivors are definitely crowd pleasers.
aircrafts haven't seen active duty for over 50 years, but pilot John Langham has managed to sustain a hit. What's the lunch, gas? Did it make a noise? I felt the thump. I felt the thump, but didn't see anything. And then um, it was just off the airfield. As we did that line abreast pass, you know, the last pass to finish. And I felt a bit of a thump. Uh, and then, uh, of course, as we climbed up, joining on Tom, fortunately I was on his left, so he just looked back and said, You've had a bird strike. A little cleaner out. We'll have her flying again today. Yeah. We'll just, yeah, we've got to fix our webbing in the main spar there. Hey, the only one thing, Jeff. What? Who gets the duck? Hang oh, on, you can have it. You can have it. Later. The war horses were on hand with a mocked up prison camp complete with escape committee. Just a basically a loose group of, of, of enthusiasts, predominantly tied up with this air show, uh, but we also do other events. We've got something like 78 vehicles here from all over the country, including a contingent who've driven all the way down from the North Island. Um, I think we've got 48 people in uniform, period uniform, RAF, etc. And uh, this whole uh, complex has been totally prefabricated and brought down here on, on pallets. Tonight we start taking it down at half past four and by six o'clock it'll be on its way back north. Features of warbirds over Wanaka is the opportunity to get close to the aircraft and the pilots and observe some of the fine tuning. see the aircraft uh, of times gone by restored and in the condition that they are in now is absolutely wonderful. Best air show I've been to. There's really nothing else like it. 
I'm from Australia and there's just none of the air shows at home compared to this one. Friends of mine have flown these things during the war. I think Spitfire is one of the most elegant of the planes, and uh, she's wonderful to watch flying. And to see the Mustang and the Spitfire up together is just brilliant. I've, tu I've touched all these things, and I'm never going to wash my hands again. <laughs> How does that sound? Very comfortable. Yeah, it is. All the World War II stuff. Yeah, they're great, aren't they? They're really good. And I've got to watch your dad. Is this your dad? Is it? Not everything gets off the ground, and they really add to the atmosphere. common in New Zealand, uh, driving uh, generating plants and um, water pumps and uh, shearing shed uh, plant especially, especially on remote shed stations and so on. And, um, and then you've, we've got a, uh, a tangy, this is a two-cylinder marine diesel. Making their third appearance at Wanaka, the team from Classic Fire Engine. C-130 Hercules, a modern-day workhorse for armed forces around the world. Each of its four engines puts out 4,900 horsepower. The Hercules can manage a payload of 20 tons with ease, and empty, well, it's a real performer. Members of New Zealand's Air Force Parachute Team have left the aircraft. The race is on. Who will be first on the ground? The skydivers or their transport?
the best seats in the house at three storeys up. The Royal New Zealand Air Force in another form, the Red Checkers aerobatic team. The Red Checkers were established back in 1973 and took their name from the distinctive red and white checker pattern on the cowling of the original Harvard aircraft. These days they are flying CT4E trainers. The pilots themselves are all instructors at the RNZAF's Central Flying School. They are all volunteers and all practices are done in their spare time. Done, the Royal New Zealand Navy has sent along a Sea Sprite helicopter. Sea Sprites operate from the Navy's frigates. They're used for anti submarine and anti ship surveillance and rescues. It's equipped with search radar, electronic support measures, magnetic anomaly detectors, and an acoustic data link. There are two General Electric T700 turbines putting out 1,600 horsepower each with a top speed of 120 knots. In terms of armaments, the Sea Sprite carries homing torpedoes, depth charges, Maverick air surface missiles and an M60 machine gun. team from the Royal New Zealand Air Force show off their Air Mackey MB339 training aircraft. Their twin seaters powered by a Rolls-Royce Viper 680 turbojet with a top speed of 600 miles an hour. Tumalisa, 
A Swedish biplane dating from 1919 makes its first appearance in the Southern Hemisphere along with its Swedish pilot Michael Carlson. Normally I travel around in Northern Europe, so I'm, I'm very lucky that uh, Tim Wallace wanted me down here. Well, he can't go further from Sweden. It's also a honeymoon trip for Carlson and his wife Gunilla. The Tumalisa first flew in late 1919, entering service with the Swedish Army Air Corps in 1920. This example is a replica, but with the original Larone nine-cylinder, 90-horsepower rotary engine. Well, yeah, horsepower and technology. They don't fly like other aircraft. It's, uh, these old ones, they, they didn't have the technology when they built them or designed them. They were just happy if they could say, hang in the air, fly. So it flies with a different technique than modern aircraft. So they have to be treated another way. They're not difficult, but just different to fly. The loops on the wingtips are to help stabilize uneven landings. Michael Carlson is a seasoned Warbirds pilot. We saw him earlier flying the Blériot 11. For a day job, he flies as well, Boeing 737s. High-speed aerobatics to thrill the crowd. This is an extra 260, similar to the one flown by Patty Wagstaff in the United States. Except this one is half the size and controlled from the ground by Fraser Briggs, ranked among the world's top radio control pilots. The extra is powered by a 150cc two-stroke engine with a composite fuselage and foam wings. Time for full-scale aerobatics, the Edge 540, flown by top New Zealand aerobatic pilot Steve Taylor. Lycoming IO540 engine, the Edge weighs only 1,200 pounds. state-of-the-art aerobatic craft. The wing is made entirely of composite materials. The propeller is foam carbon fibre and titanium. Taylor is a keen war. 
warbird pilot as well, flying Harvard's and the Polycarpov I-16. He flew a pit special for many years, finally selling it to buy this Edge 540. Most the highlight of Warbirds over Wanaka 2000, the rolling out of Hawker Hurricane P3351. One of only eight left flying in the world and the result of six years hard work and restoration. And the dream of Warbirds founder, Sir Tim Wallace. Followed by Dusty Miller, a World War II hurricane pilot who flew this very aircraft in England. Over eight years ago, the hurricane was a mangled wreck lying in a Russian swamp, having crashed sometime in 1943. Salvaged and shipped to England, where it underwent initial restoration by Hawker Restorations, the craft was then shipped to New Zealand, where a team from Air New Zealand Engineering Services completed the task. P3351 took to the skies again for the first time in almost 60 years in January 2000. At the controls then, and now, Alpine fighter collection pilot Keith Skilling. The job of the display pilot is to show the capabilities and specific features of the particular aeroplane. I think we all owe a huge amount to Sir Tim for having the foresight and drive to find, recover, and rebuild these wonderful machines. And Jeremy Burgess. Also with the team. And uh, obviously he's still learning how to start it. There's no problem. Also, with the The Hurricane is joined by the Mark 16 Spitfire, piloted by Ray Hanna from England. This is the moment everyone's been waiting for. Ray Hanna has the more powerful Spitfire throttled back to stay in formation with the Hurricane. The most important aspect of a formation aerobatic team, or formation aerobatics in this case, is the leader. And Ray Hanna is one of the best in the world at leading formations. Although this is only the second time that I've flown the Hurricane in formation, I've flown with Ray lots of times in the past, and he is extremely smooth and accurate, which makes it very easy for me. The takeoff is a magic moment, especially for Sir Tim Wallace. It was a great takeoff, a great takeoff. Can you know? I can, as better, I. I dreamed, I dreamed of, I dreamed of, 
Now my dreams come true. Although the Hurricane is a beautiful aeroplane to fly, it's not that easy to fly in formation. The elevators are quite stiff, it doesn't roll that well, and it moves about a bit directionally, particularly at high angles of bank, it tends to crab along a little bit with the tail down. And of course, in this formation, it has difficulty keeping up with the Spitfire. This particular Spitfire is a Mark 16, and that was about as good as they got with the development of the Spitfire. It's very powerful and it's beautifully harmonised in the controls. The Hurricane is not as powerful, so it has some difficulty in keeping up. Side by side, the two heroes of the Battle of Britain. good fighter because it could outturn most of its foes. So we'd like to show nice tight turns. The aircraft also had to be presented um, at all angles, canopy towards the crowd to show off the particular plan form and camouflage, and of course belly towards the crowd to show the distinctive colour scheme. However, the first priority of the display pilot is to keep it safe. So we use very, very simple manoeuvres and the aeroplanes are treated very gently. concentrations outside the airplane.
Keith Skilling readies the hurricane for landing. Prior to landing on the downwind, the most important thing, of course, is to put the undercarriage down and check that it's down. The hurricane's a very easy airplane to land compared to a lot of the other fighters. It's uh, easier to see over the nose and quite easy to three point. Taxis back, there's a Spitfire salute and a standing ovation from the crowd. One of the beauties of Wanaka is that we can taxi so close to the spectators, they can almost touch the airplanes. It's a huge thrill to see so many smiling, happy people really appreciating these wonderful airplanes. during the war, Jack Stafford has a chance for a close look. What I wanted to do all my life from the time I, had, I was at school and, the, and the, the war started, I wanted to be a fighter pilot, I wanted to fly a single seat fighter and the Hurricane was the first single seat fighter that I ever flew, so of course I loved it. The uh, squadron was 486 New Zealand Fighter Squadron. Uh, the motto was Maori, and it was Hiwa Haumaka, which meant beware of the wild wind. And without the hurricane, which shot down four German aircraft, for every one that was killed by every other aircraft, plus the flak and everything else, without the hurricane, I think they would have been in, in big trouble. I suppose it's not any one particular memory that comes flooding back, but what you, what you actually experience um, is an atmosphere. It's, um, it's just something that sort of, uh, the memory wells up inside you from the smells, the sights, and everything there that so, was so familiar all those 50 odd years ago. And when you get into it and you're old and you're awkward compared to what you used to be like, and you sort of um, awkwardly scramble down, sit on the seat and your elbows, you wonder how on earth you used to leap onto it and with one bound get into the cockpit. It, uh, it really is a fighter. You know, you get into this, you couldn't mistake yourself as being in a transport aircraft or a train or anything else. Somehow or other, even just the stick, the trigger, the reflector sight, all of these sort of things. When you'd get into a situation where you might be going into combat, you turn it on to fire like that, and then all you have to do is press your thumb on that little button there, and you've got eight machine guns in this particular one go off, and the later ones you'd have a couple of cannons and, I don't know, maybe four machine guns, something like that. At the present time, I'm in the prime of senility, so don't get me wrong, but, uh, you know, things, uh, as slow as the old wheels start to turn around in the, in the retarded brain, gradually the stuff sort of, I remember it, you know, just sort of starts to stick out and, and you know, you've got your throttle and your pitch and everything else and your mixture all over here and there's your undercarriage over there and you've got your tanks down here and you go through your cockpit drill, trim, mixture, pitch, fuel, flaps, instruments, that's what you had to do before you take off. So, you know, you can see them all and they, that old, cockpit drill is exactly the same today as it was then, so you look at these things and gradually the, um, the old love affair starts again. It's like um, reuniting with uh, a love of your youth, possibly. <laughs> 
And this was certainly a love of mine. I loved it. P-51D Mustangs, known affectionately as the Cadillacs of the Sky, take off, watched closely by a Messerschmitt ME-108 Tarfin, which is also keeping an eye on the Spitfire back on the ground. One of the most versatile fighters of the Second World War, the Mustang was also the first fighter capable of escorting bombers all the way to Berlin and back. Originally powered by an Allison engine, it was later fitted with a Rolls-Royce Merlin, which greatly boosted its performance and helped turn the tide of war against Germany. In the Pacific, the Mitsubishi Zero had few rivals. Even so, very few Zeros survived the war. This particular model is a replica from the Toro 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 movie. And in hot pursuit, two Curtis P-40 Kitty Hawks. The scene is set for a replay of the Battle of the Pacific.
zero is taken out and the Kitty Hawks enjoy a victory lap. to get up close for a look are two former Kitty Hawk pilots, Australians John Bailey and Charles Bowley. Really quite authentic, haven't they? Wonderfully done. And on the other side they had the camera gun, uh, which was uh, used for checking the... Uh, mm. Whenever any aircraft got down somewhere near where there was a bit of grog, and uh, you, you'd fill the empty ammunition boxes with a bit of grog and take it back. It was nice and cold by the time you got there. Remember, we used to put our grog in there 
and all our beer was in the, or, and cigarettes just to go in there if we had any of it. Mainly cigarettes because we all smoked in those days, at least I did anyway. And one, one of our chaps, a chap called Greg Mogg, had to ditch one day and all he was worried about was all the cigarettes he'd lost. <laughs> it didn't matter, he got killed later on. He, he got killed later on, but at the time, he got rescued by a Catalina, by the way. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that was off Wee Whack in New Guinea. And that, that's the flying log book. Prove it that it was, was me. <laughs> and they transferred me to number 75 squadron, which is in Milne Bay to start with, and then we went to Good Enough Island. A29448. Local practice, 15 minutes, 448. Formation practice, an hour and five. So, that's something, isn't it? Um, I last flew a Kitty Hawk at um, Numfor Island. Um, the uh, top end of New Guinea um, in about August 1944 and uh, haven't flown one since. Well I can remember an occasion taking off it good enough when a piece of paper flew up from the floor and got round my goggles and I thought I'd bought it because we were playing, a, we took off in pairs and I was number two but fortunately I don't know whether it was in this plane or not but I didn't, nothing happened. I, I got, the, got the piece of paper away in, in time. One of the, um, uh, the most vivid memories I have is when we were doing attacks on aerodromes and uh, coming in through, you know, they used to throw everything at us and it was a wall of flags. It looked like hail sometimes and, uh, you know, in the back of your mind is, how the hell am I going to get through that? But you do and you get a few holes in the plane but none of it ever hit anything vital and none of it ever hit me, so I think I was lucky. I did 75 operational missions in 75 squadron and a fellow West Australian came up to take my place, took out my aeroplane on his first mission, he never came back. The de Havilland Vampire, a single engine jet fighter. It entered service with the Royal Air Force in 1946 and has been flown by the air forces of 21 countries. With a distinctive twin boom tail, the Vampire is powered by a Goblin turbojet and is capable of a top speed of around 460 knots. MiG-15 was a wake-up call to the West on its debut in the Korean War.
top speed of 570 knots, 680 miles an hour, coupled with a faster rate of climb and higher ceiling, the MiG could outperform practically any Allied aircraft. Better training and equipment gave the Allied pilots the upper hand, however. Dating from the 50s, the Fuga Magister was designed as a jet trainer. Powered by two Turbomica turbojets, delivering 880 pounds of thrust each, the French-built Magister has a top speed of 400 knots. by many NATO countries, the Magister has also been adapted to carry weapons and is used by some countries as a light attack aircraft.
while the Warbirds take a well-earned break and get ready for the finale, on the ground there's still plenty to see and do, and buy. Hello, how are you today? Warbirds get back into the air again for the show-stopping finale. A massed mock attack on the airstrip and battle in the air. An increasingly rare opportunity to see these aircraft doing what they were designed to do. And then to close the show, a fly past, led by the Hercules, Fuga Magister and de Havilland Vampires, Mustang, Spitfire, Kitty Hawks and Hurricane. Polycarpovs, I-16s and 153s. and the distinctive sound of the harbour.
visitors get a chance to wave farewell to the warbirds as the weekend draws to a close. No ducks. No ducks, no. <laughs> Other than on the doors. A lot of hard work, long hours and dedication have gone into making this event even more special and spectacular than previous Warbirds over Wanaka shows and making it the biggest Warbird show in the Southern Hemisphere. See you again, Easter 2002.